riverside Is it a natural state of how it's supposed to be I think there's something that we just don't see Welcome. This is We Act Radio, broadcasting from Anacostia, Nacochtank land, known as Historic Anacostia, Washington, D.C. This is the program called Community Through COVID. I am the host, Virginia Avniel Spatz. And today's program, we return to a conversation, a very important one, from D.C. 101, with Bruce, Dr. Bruce Purnell, Executive Director of the Love More Movement, Christy Matthews, Coordinator for the DC Girls Coalition of Black Swan Academy, Ambrose Lane Jr., Founder and Chair of DC's Health Alliance Network, and Raven Freeborn, Senior Policy and Advocacy Manager, Mama Toto Village. DC 101 is a monthly political education program of Serve Your City DC and Ward 6 Mutual Aid. What follows is a very slightly edited version of the presentation from May 26th on health. The earlier portion we saw last week, plus additional information is available at communitythroughcovid.com. The previous segment ended with a discussion of mothers and infants. This seg segment, which is moderated by Maurice Cook, Executive Director of Serve Your City DC and moderator of the whole DC 101 uh, project. In this uh, segment that we're about to see, Maurice Cook is asking Christy Matthews about the young people she meets through the DC Girls Coalition. And we will start that sharing in just a moment. And this is DC 101. How, how, do, you, how do you confront and, and, and how do you shape and mold our young people to feel that self-empowerment, that they are the ones that have the power to dictate uh, their future outcome? Absolutely. Before I get into that, I want to express how important healing is. Because when you were giving those COVID um statistics and all the things the thing that comes to mind for me is that what we don't talk about enough within the black community within the community in general is that the distrust that black people have for the healthcare system and the healthcare outcomes and things that maybe could be should it be people think are good for them and the reality is, is there's a distrust and we have reasons to have said distrust um to see the airman i mean the list goes on um, and that is one of the reasons why I think um, it's important to know that because with the vaccine and things that are coming out about the vaccine, um, no one is addressing the concerns that black and brown people have expressed around why they don't want to take it and instead are treating them as if they're crazy. They are just like these people who don't want to listen. And the reality is, there is a reason why people don't want to take that and we need to address that. So I just wanted to put that out there because that's just what I do. Um, but to answer your question is, first of all, young people come to me in a variety of ways. But what I will say is when young people come to me, they come to me in a variety of states. And I have young people who, who I'm working with who are struggling with housing, taking care of their younger siblings, trying to graduate, trying to like get a job, all kinds of spaces. And when I interact with young people, um, what I try to do, and hopefully I do a good job of, is let them know that they are experts at what they are experiencing. I don't have the answer. I don't necessarily know the answer. You're the expert. I'm here to help guide you to that solution. And what I will say is for the young people I've been working with, the overarching theme that has been coming up for them is around emotional and mental health. They have expressed how difficult it is to focus on their physical health when they are sick because of the anxiety they're experiencing. They are sick because of the trauma they're being told to just go to school and deal with. When you have traumatic experiences and you're trying to express those experiences, whether that comes out verbally and you actually say that, 
that comes out with you fighting another student or yelling at a teacher that comes out with you not wanting to do your work. There are ways it comes out. Instead of people addressing what is causing those, those outcomes, they address the outcome. And then the young person doesn't feel heard. And so when young people come to me, I, you know, I've had young people yell at me. I've had young people like do all kinds of things. But the reality that I have to keep remembering is that there is trauma. There is things that they are dealing with that we as adults don't understand. And this, this environment that COVID has created is one that they are just like we are learning to live in. And, and I think that is crucial because young people are often dismissed. Young people are often, their experience isn't acknowledged. When they come to you and say, this is what I need, they get a lot of, yes, absolutely. We need that as a community. But no one actually tries to do the thing that they're asking to do. Um, we have young people, like I've had people, you know, come to me. I almost made a young person come to this panel. because like, they can tell you. Why do I need to tell you? Um, but it, I just couldn't get it together in time. But um I think that the point I'm trying to make is that youth in D.C. are struggling. But what youth are also doing is going to school. They're also helping take care of their other siblings. They're also managing their community. They're also working jobs. They're also like trying to do the health situation and figure it all out. But what they're doing is doing that through the struggle. And we often think about us as a collective, how we're doing that during the struggle. I mean, in my, both of my jobs, they, we always talk about mental health days and how we can do this and what we need to do. We don't talk about mental health days for DCPS. DCPS don't take off mental health days for the young people to be able to do that. But the teachers get mental health days. The teachers get sick leave. But young people don't get that. We are expecting young people because they're kids and they have an experienced life to keep moving forward. We had a panel. We had a youth summit in April. And there was young people as young as in elementary school expressing trauma, expressing what they needed from their community, expressing what they weren't getting what they were trying to receive and how their parents were struggling to make it happen and their parents were struggling to support them and they weren't getting the resources even though they're like telling everyone they need it you know and this is the reality of what is happening i have youth i have nieces, two of my nieces are here now like the struggle is real and as a collective as a community our history is to come together and support each other but what covid did is made that not possible that's what COVID did. It made it impossible for us to come together as a collective and support each other in a safe way. And what unfortunately fell through the cracks is the emotional support young people were receiving from their distant family, from that uncle that's not an uncle, but he always talking in their head, from that auntie who, you know, you can go with me to get your nails done, but that ain't happening during COVID. And so they're not getting those releases, but they are expected to produce things. They're expected to go to the next grade. They're expected to do all these things. And so for me, when we talk about health, we need to kind of, we need to do a drastic focus on emotional health because you can't fight anything health physically if you don't have the emotional capacity to do it. You can't fight diabetes. You can't fight cancer. You can't fight these things that we're expecting young people to fight. We're expecting them to see their parents go through if you don't have the emotional support there. And we as a collective have failed young people and we haven't given it to them. And so what I try to do in my line of work is my young people know they can call me whenever and trust me, they do. Um, I try to do my best to be supportive and do what I can and get them to the resources they, they need. But what I do more than anything is just listen. That's what I do more than anything, because there is value in being in space with an adult who doesn't try to rush you off the phone. There is value in being in space with an adult who understands that, no, I can't talk about what you need me to do policy wise, because right now I'm just struggling to wake up. That's what I'm struggling to do. And so knowing that that's what I try to do with the youth that I'm working with. And that's what I try to bring them to the table to do. And what that has produced is young people. The summit was completely ran by the young people I work with. I didn't do anything except play music, which, you know, I'm down to do. But they ran that summit. They asked the questions. They pulled the people up. They kept things moving. They kept time because they have a community of adults who are supporting them and able to step in when they need it and supporting their parents. Because let's be honest, they can't do this on their own because they're dealing with the other stuff. So, like, that. 
that was a little a bit of a tangent, but that's where I'm at. <laughs> no, thank you so much, Christy, and thank you also for bringing up, uh, you know, our natural, understandable hesitancy to trust anything coming from the United States government. Of course, we distrust this this United States government because it continues to find a way to put us under the ground or in a cage. That it does without any effort. And so, you know, we were talking about, when I was talking about the COVID, you know, our hesitancy for whatever reason, it didn't create the disparity on who got COVID, right? Our hesitancy has nothing to do with that, okay? So yes, I mean, when it comes to, and we need to talk about it, you're, you're absolutely right. We have to talk about it more, you know, I, and we're going to talk, and Ambrose, I'm glad I'm going to bring you up in, in, in this piece of it. And I know, I know you want to talk about what, uh, what Raven was talking about, but let me just say this to you directly, Ambrose. They do not resource the people who are on the ground every day working with the community to ensure that everyone, our people, have the information. You know how I know? You can imagine how I know, right, uh, Brother Ambrose? Because we are on the ground every day. And we have never received any support from the city government. We, we get turned down from vaccine hesitancy grant opportunities. And pull your bite out. I know you're. And, am I angry? You, you, you're damn right I'm angry. I'm, ang I'm angry because you know we organized with a group of people who, over the last year, risked their lives, never stayed at home, never isolated, fed people, gave people masks, did everything that was necessary while a group of nonprofits in this city, and I will start naming names, took PPP, got funded by the city, and got funded by the foundations. And if you are in that situation, I would come out first because that the truth is going to come out. Now, we die because you know, we do know in order to be resourced in this town, you got to be in the room. And to be in the room, you got to kiss somebody's ring. You got to kiss somebody's tail. You got to play nice. But those of us who don't have that ability because we love our people way more than we love the people that, that are in that room. This is why the information, this is why the numbers look like they do. And this is not about Maurice or Serve Your City or Ward 6 Mutual Aid. This is about the suffering that our people perpetually are experiencing. And I don't. You are listening to the voice of Maurice Cook from Serve Your City and Ward 6 Mutual Aid in Washington, DC. This is a broadcast of DC 101 on health. And this is Community Through COVID on We Act Radio. I believe that they're serious about fixing that. Why? I saw on a, in an article, Brother Ambrose, and I'm yelling at Ambrose because Ambrose has, Ambrose has access to these folks. So I, saw, I just saw today, Brother Ambrose, they're going to be closing vaccination sites. Soon. So, so, so Maurice, where, where do I even start, Brother? Um, for, first of all, you know I don't kiss no rings. So they, you know. Um, but but let me let me hit on a couple of different points, um, and, and I'm piggyback on a couple of things that all three of the other presenters uh, have either talked about or uh, can relate to. Uh, first is on the maternal health side. So I had Councilmember Christina Henderson on my at my April meeting. She presented, and she tells the story of her as a black woman getting ready to have a baby did all her prenatal work um, at a hospital. And when it came time to actually deliver, she went to that hospital. And she told this story on my, on my Zoom call. I have it recorded. She went to that hospital when it was time to give birth and the hospital said to her, they don't have any more room. She had to go to another hospital on the fly Okay, that 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 gives you a sense of what women are experiencing, and she's a city council member right now. Now she introduced legislation 
to try to bring a birth center east of the river, which I supported. She is a, a part of her legislation also included um, reimbursement payments at living wage prices for doulas. That's what her legislation was about. And I supported that legislation because that was the right thing to do. But that is because of years of negligence of maternal health. Years. They closed the maternal health ward at United Medical Center. And women have to go and take an hour to an hour and a half trip from Ward 7 and Ward 8 across the river to get prenatal services. Okay. And we fought, the Health Alliance Network fought hard for what will end up being a level two uh, maternal health ward at the new hospital when it is built. We had to fight tooth and nail to get that because they didn't want to put that in. On another, on another note about trauma, because this is something that Dr. Bruce deals with all the time. And he presented to us last month and I got him coming in June because they produced a paper that was just a fantastic piece that talked about the trauma of black men and boys. And of course, June is the maternal, is the, is the men's health month. And, and we talk about trauma, you know, trauma of violence, trauma of the disparities, but the, here is the truth. The truth is, is that our sojourn in this country has been one long trauma. It has not been, you know, hey, we have a trauma over here, and then, hey, that trauma subsided. And then a couple of years later, we got a trauma over here. That's not how it has been. It has been a, an incessant, ongoing trauma, one right after another, after another, and after another. So our communities at every single level, every single level, it, just because you're Black and you are educated and got a, got a job and got... And, and, and got your degree doesn't mean that you are not experiencing trauma as a result of racism, as a result of not getting the job that you thought you deserved to get. The trauma is ongoing at every single level. And th this is something that I know Bruce speaks to, right? And, and, and then Christy was really hitting it. I mean, she was hitting it out of the park. Um, the trauma that our youth are going through you know, I was on a on a call the other day, and uh, the brother asked the question: Are we demanding too much of our youth um, in terms of as, asking them to step up and take the reins? And and I said, No, we we're not asking too much, but they but there is a real schism because young people don't feel as though they were given the tools. We haven't created the atmosphere to be able to give them the tools to be able to take the reins. You know, I did rites of passage at Union Temple Baptist Church. We took we took our middle school boys. We took them for two weeks, and they were changed after those two weeks because we had them to ourselves. The society didn't have them. Commercialism didn't have them. We had them as brothers to these young brothers. We had them, and we got into their heads, and we brought out all of the things, all of the anger, all of the pain that they were feeling and then shaped it and molded it to be able to send them back into the world with a new vision, with a new perspective, with a new understanding of who they are as young Black brothers. And we don't have those institutions. We, we Pockets here, pockets there, but as a whole of a community, we don't have those institutions that groom our young people and giving them the tools that they need to thrive. And they're angry, they're pissed off, they're everything. And they have an absolute right to be. And until we provide that for them, yes, it's going to be like that. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad that the three other panelists are here. I love the work that they do, but we got to realize you know, we, we're, we're all in this area fighting in that area and, and we got to continue those fights, but we've got to also understand the totality of it. And that, that totality, again, is based on really 
racism which created poverty. Poverty didn't create itself. Racism created poverty. White supremacy created poverty. And we have got to undo it. And we have the ability, even in this city, like you said, Maurice, we have the resources to do all of the things to undo the things that racism did, that created all of the pockets, all of the social determinants that are negative that we are all fighting. And I'll stop there. Well, thank you, brother. Thank you. Um, you know, Bruce, you on the ground, brother. And you, you, <laughs> you in the trenches. And... And I know we were talking earlier, you know, before the show, um, they need they need Internet access where you work. Right, brother. Our children, our families need Internet access. And, you know, I try my best. If there is a need for, our, you know, that our people have, I do my best to go, go, you know, deal with that need. And at the same time, the trauma is that it is a need. And why is it a need? Who created the need? Who creates the scarcity? Right? Why is there scarcity of, of internet access for some of us? And so talk about it's because obviously it's not just internet access. But talk about just having internet access as 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 one example. Talk about some of the, the community from which you work and, 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 and the level of, of you know, lack of re basic resources that we have to confront before we can even address the interpersonal and the familial and the social and the institutional trauma that we have to face. Because if you're always fighting for the basics, like our elders, like our ancestors had to, how do you have the capacity, you know, like Christy and Raven and Ambrose were saying, how do you have the capacity to address these other harms, these other trauma? Well, uh, first let me say what uh, what Christy, Ambrose, and Raven said, man. I, I love my people, man. I, uh, uh, wow. It's, uh, it's so refreshing to know that we have such great minds and great energy and great creativity and intelligence that's, that's that's addressing this piece man that's you know that that's that's so refreshing other piece man let me let me start with the good news right the good news the good news is that we're valuable enough to love and be loved we're valuable yeah. enough say it again one more time i just got to hear it again <laughs> we're valuable enough to love and be loved amen right Everything that has happened to us over the, since the time we've been in this country has shown that the common denominator is that we are love. The, the, the fact that we are here right now, we're, we're, it's a miracle that we're here right now. Like, and I always stress that we give each other a pass. However you're able to navigate this trauma and make it where you're at, like, it's a miracle. You're a miracle, right? So we, we, need, to, we need to understand that about each other. So we stop... Uh, Looking at, looking at ourselves the way others look at us. It's, it's, it's one theory uh, they call the looking the looking glass self. It was Cal, it was uh, Charles Cooley, uh, I think 1902 or something. It was, it's, it's a major piece of our identity formation, right? We see ourselves, you know, the way that we perceive others see us. So if we if we see ourselves ourselves through through the eyes of our oppressor, how do you think we see ourselves? Like Malcolm said, who who taught us to hate ourselves? Like, you know what I mean? Like, we have to know that we love ourselves. Like, we have to understand that's all a lie. We, 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 we have been through, we've gone through every era of this trauma, and, and we, we're still here today, right? So I just want to say, like, you know, to know, like, you know, the good news is that, you know, we're, we're here right now, and we still uh, are represent love, and, and in the spirit of our ancestors, we, we have to reconnect to uh, the legacy of moving toward liberation. Like, so we have to understand, we have to un understand that piece. The, the lack of resources, one, like the biggest resource right now is what's our purpose, man? Like what, what's our purpose for our children? Mm. Before, we, before we talk about what anybody needs, like what's the purpose that we have for our children? And Malcolm also said like, Greg, like, you know, um, how would you uh, allow your oppressor to teach your children? 
who made that call? I don't know who made that call. I've been searching to find out who made that call, right? I don't, I don't know who made that call, but you know what I mean? But we even dealt with that also. But we have to know where we're going from here. And, 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 and another good news piece. We don't have to recreate the insanity that came before this pandemic. This pandemic gives us an opportunity to recreate something else. We don't have to go back to that. That didn't work. We're all miserable, depressed, uh, high anxiety, high depression, high trauma, all, all, the, all the different ills like, that come from that. Like, so that didn't work. We can say that didn't work. We can create something else. And that's the healing piece, right? Yeah, we need, yeah, we need to resource. Like our children, for example, and I, I love to use the metaphor of the uh, transformation of the, uh, the caterpillars of the butterfly, because if we could see the caterpillar as a future butterfly, we would protect that journey of the caterpillar. We rarely talk about the journey of the caterpillar. We celebrate the beauty of the butterfly, but rarely talk about the journey of the caterpillar. We might even spray poison on a caterpillar if it's on a flower. It's a furry pest, like maybe we don't, if we can't see it that way. How we see our children? In that same metaphor, do we see our children as a future butterfly? If so, wouldn't we protect their journey? Wouldn't we be excited about their journey to see what kind of butterfly they were going to become? So are the way that we look at this, we got to change the way that we look at this right now. Like, you know, I mean, we have to get excited about our children, about their journey. Then they won't have the resources. Why? Because we're not, we're not going to stand for them not having it. You know what I mean? Like, how, how are we going to compete in what's next? First, but we have to understand what's next. Because it can't be what, what we came out of. We move into another era, right? You muted, brother. There yeah. you go. The, the same way that we went from the typewriter to the computer, we're going from the computer to the virtual world right now. We, we move into another era. So it's a whole other way. We're, not, we're never going back to the way it was. So how are we preparing? Are we even talking about this right now? So, you know, we, we have to huddle up. Take time out. We got to heal. We got to we got to take some deep breaths, man. Go back to our old spirituality, not the new, not the not the new spirituality where we're trying to, you know, we're trying to uh, get these paper dollars, right? The old spirituality where it's about like healing and, and about moving toward moving toward liberation, right? And we have to huddle up and come up with a purpose before we do anything else. We can't move. We can't move in, in, until we make those in, until we make those moves. And we got some wonderful, powerful. Uh, brothers and sisters in our community that have been there, like a like a Mama Karen Settles, like a like a like a uh, Miss Senior DC who been through a fire, lost everything, competed, still competing as, as Miss Senior DC today. You know what I mean? We got that kind of strength around us. Oh, why, why can't we listen? Like you know, we have to bring them to the table, listen to our elders, get a direction, and then see where we're going to go. Right? So I'm excited about what's next. No, I'm excited about what's next. You know what I mean? I um. When I talk to my, my young people and I hear, you know, um, the kind of brilliance and creativity that they come with, I'm excited about them. You know, I, you know, I want to give a legacy of a legacy of joy to them. I don't want to keep like uh, brother uh, Baba Dick Gregory said in the piece, he said, look, like they taught me so much about the ugliness of the devil that I didn't know the beauty of God until I was a grown man. He said that, the, you know, the filth will take care of itself. Like, so. We need to look at like right now, look at our greatness, look at our brilliance, look at our beauty right now. Like, and, cause we can't keep talking about like identifying the trauma. What about the joy? Where are the triggers to our happiness? Like where are the triggers to our joy? What are the best moments of our life? The time we laugh the most, the time we love the most, the time that, you know, our best experiences, we need to reflect back on those pieces and, and take that to the next place. Because we're not gonna, we're not gonna get out of this by uh, re Articulating the pain. We know what the pain is. We've been whipped since we've been in this country. We know what the pain we know. If anybody knows what trauma is, we gotta know what trauma is. Like we we know oh, we, we can tell you all about trauma, all about jail, all about all the disparities, but like you know, about the joy. So when we start to talk about joy and start to change that narrative to a love language, a love and light language, a, a, an affirmative language, we start to spread affirmations in our community. Let's stop uh, spreading the suppression of negatives in our neighborhoods. Let's spread, let's spread affirmations and, and joy. Well, clearly, brother, we need you in all of our neighborhoods, you know? You were just listening to the voice of Dr. Bruce Purnell, who is executive director of the Love More Mu Movement. This is part of the DC 101 health programming. And this is a community through COVID program on WE Act Radio Broadcasting 
from historic Anacostia, Washington, DC. We continue with DC 101. You, the next voice will be Maurice Cook. And because we, we, we need this message. Uh, this, is the, this is the message that has always pushed us forward. I've heard this message before. I feel it in my bones. It, it, it's, it's when it's hopeless and you still got light, you know, when, when you still have hope, when there's, there's no way, but you find a way. And, and, and you have that energy and you have that spirit. We, 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 need, to, we need to spread, you know, all of, all of you, we need to make sure that we can embed, uh, you know, you into the communities that need, need us the most. And, and you know, the, I, like I said, you know, there are just so many challenges. And, and, you know, our young people, unlike us, you know, and, and I won't talk about all of us, but some of us was raised on about three to four TV channels, right? That, that you know, my first job, I was a remote control. You know I mean? That was my first official job. You know, I had to turn on, turn the channel. That was my first job. Didn't get paid. That was my first internship. Let me put it that way. And so these young people are exposed to everything, right? They see the way everybody lives. And, and the challenge is the, the little things that we used to do, I feel they, they are minimized. And, it, and it's, it's, it's hard because I feel like so many of our young people are comparing themselves to people that have so much because they have so much exposure to that. And where there was a time for us well, we, you know, a lot of people, I had no idea I was poor. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I, didn't, I didn't know I was poor. I had no idea I was poor until I learned I was poor, right? But you, in order to learn that you're poor, that means you, you're making a comparative study. You're doing it. And so when it comes to our young people, talk about some of the policies that you feel um, have, could, could, be, could, could be game changers or could, could move us along the path and some of the policies that have been, been harmful and detrimental to our health. Absolutely. And I think um, for me, I do a, a power training um, that really focuses on how what we have to understand is that there are things that we see and things that people tell us that we need to address. Like, when, for example, when you think about what's the issue with affordable housing? They, what's the issue with affordable housing? You hear oh, people just need, people don't have jobs, people don't have this, but the reality is there is no affordable housing because housing costs too much. That's the reality. And that's the thing with any issue. They have us fighting for things that actually aren't the problem, and that's why the solutions don't work. Um, and that's the reality. Um, and so when we look at health, um, I think one of the biggest reasons the majority of the policies don't work is because we're not addressing the myths that health is something that can be brought and more deliberate should be brought. Being healthy is something you should pay for. That's something you have to pay for. And that shouldn't be the reality. It should be something that all of us have and all of us have access to it. I'm not just talking physical health. I'm talking about mental, social, emotional health. There are, that is the reality. Everything costs and depending on how much money you have, that's what you can get the resources for. The young people I'm working with, the things that they are advocating for as it relates to health is number one, um, they feel like a big policy that needs to be implemented. Um, and there is some things within the council right now in DC specifically, is consent at 16 needs to be reduced um, health care needs to be reduced to consent at 16. And what they're specifically asking is for the agency to set their own doctor's appointments, um, the agency to get access to their own medical record, um, and for a variety of reasons. Number one, some young people, they don't have the relationship with their parents or their guardians. They don't, they don't have that. And when they try to make a doctor's appointment because they're sick, they're told your parent has to make it, your parent has to be here. And there are a significant amount of young people in D.C. and a, well over the world, really, who are the primary caregivers for their families. Their parents might be sick themselves. Their parents may, they are the ones making the doctor's appointment. They are the ones taking siblings to the doctor. I have a young person who just took her younger sibling to get his eyes checked. They're the ones doing it. And so they want agencies to be able to do that without having to be met with a doctor who knows they're the one setting the meeting and saying, where's your parent? When the parent hasn't been here the last six times I've come. 
Um, so that's one policy that we're advocating for locally. Um, and then what we're also advocating for as it relates to mental health is making it so social emotional support and mental health training and work is something that is implemented within every aspect of our curriculum, not an afterthought not something that happens when a crisis occurs, but something that we all learn, just like we all learn what one plus one is, ABC, the mental health coping skills is something we should just learn. It shouldn't be something that you learn after you have to deal with a traumatic experience because the reality is, number one, the world we live in is traumatic, but also coping skills are things that you need regardless because somebody else's trauma might not be your trauma and it should just be something you just know how to do. Um, and so that is something that we're advocating for and we're pushing and we're we're moving forward on and we're, we're trying to get support for. Um, and then I think that the other thing that young people are really, really pushing for that the, the DC Girls Coalition is trying to do on their own is to invest in our community healers and have healing spaces and healing circles where young people can come together and communities can come together. And as a collective, have these conversations, talk out the trauma so we can move towards that exploration of liberation, so we can move towards that love of the, as a collective, and we can take this trauma that we have been experiencing and turn it to the evolution of what love really looks like. And so what we're doing at Black Swan and at DC Girls Coalition with a number of other people is we're hosting six healing circles with a community healer where they're only for young people um, and they're going to be going through six healing circles as well as having one-on-one -on -one conversations with an adult ally to help them go through that liberative process. And that is the only focus of this. And we know that the young people we'll be working with will absolutely be involved in other campaigns and working on other advocacy. But the fact remains that what we need to do right now is get them space to heal and show them that healing can be powerful, beautiful, liberating, and make you a stronger organizer. And that is the best kept secret that is being kept for a number of reasons, because they don't want to see us thrive, they don't want to see us survive, they remove that from our community intentionally, purposely, and stop that from happening, because they know what will happen when we are liberated. When we break the shackles of the trauma, we know what's going to happen. And the reason we're doing it the way we need to, we're doing it is because what we don't want is for it to be one person that they can look at and say, this is the person we need to get rid of. No, you need to look at the entire community and don't know who leading what, because that's the only way we're going to overcome this very intentional, very orchestrated, very purposeful, purposeful community they have created us to live in. And so that's why we're doing it. So um, those are the ways that we're addressing it. Um, and I and I just I think that's really important and I will stress to anyone on this phone working with young people not working with young people whatever you're doing incorporate healing incorporate coping skills incorporate checking in and incorporate fun into every aspect of the work that you're doing because it is crucial that when we come together in a crisis we also know we can come together to celebrate um, that is very important for us to maintain these young people and help them keep the fight going and do what Ambrose was talking about, set them up for success in the future. And see, I know we're going to win because we all just naturally talk about our young people. first. I mean, that's that's where our spirit, that's where our heart, that's where our heart is. We all just naturally, that's where we're going to go first. And and, and and Raven, if if you could meet with a, 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 a an important stakeholder at, at the Wilson Building um, to make your list of demands to to build more capacity for the work that you do. What what would you demand? I want to go back to um, I, so I believe that there are no limits in the work that we can do, and that no one is bigger than the work. So I would want to meet with everybody <laughs> because um, what we really want to push for is an, an, is an agenda that addresses all the issues that lead to disparity, all the issues that lead to adverse um, health outcomes by the time Christy is interacting with our youth. So we're really focusing on the birth to free population, the folks, uh, those um, little ones um, who are in that age range and those people who are birthing folks, the health that is necessary for them to continue forward. Um, and I, 
as, as much as we are scaling up to begin to address these issues in a way that's intersectional, um, we're also really keeping our focus on this current issue with the COVID-19 crisis. And we know that we have to build a returning infrastructure that has revenue that doesn't ex extract resources from Black communities. Um, so when we're when we are um, looking at the budget hearings that we're that we're facing, um, we want to see budgets that prioritize dollars for Black communities, that prioritize dollars for workers, that prioritize protections for workers, that prioritize protections for um, birthing and pregnant folks in a way that does not extract from the existing community, and that continues to do things like taking down housing or making housing some. Uh, uh, a space where the conditions are not livable, where the conditions are not one where you will welcome community, or that the community that is holding that housing system is one that is not well resourced. Um, so we're really looking at um, intersectional issues, right? And we want to talk to everybody because birthing justice is the issue for all people. We have all been birthed into this earth. We all know someone who was birthing. Um, and so if it's not justice for our younger selves, it's justice for our future selves. You would think that it would be easy to have some solidarity around this issue, right? You know, since it's something that we've all been benefactors of, right? And and it's just we got to get it right. We have to get it right. We have to prioritize it. We have to make sure that um, the mayor and the council members understand. There was a report that just came out on the real estate investments return. <laughs> That the city has just experienced uh, i think it's over the course of the year but but we have to make sure that the numbers match from real estate investment return to where those those returns and those investments will be redistributed right to be uh reclaimed to be repurposed right to be reimagined some would say so and i, I think that's us along with, with, with our young people, because I believe we got to bring our young people along the ride, you know, so that they can see what it looks like. And, and we have no time to shelter and silo them from, from some of these experiences, unfortunately, um, because if, if we don't show them, someone else will teach them. And, and, I, believe, and I believe they will teach them differently. Uh, you know, uh, Dr. Bruce was talking about it earlier. And, and Ambrose, I know that DC Health uh, Alliance has a set of priorities uh, that they're going to be looking at, uh, you know, tomorrow, you know, with the budget, um, you know, um, coming out. And, and what are you guys thinking about? I mean, how, how, can, how can the community, how can the public uh, be involved and get engaged with, with, with your citywide work and, and, and all of the wards and, and making sure that you know we can build a, a large tent a large coalition a lot of a lot of times unfortunately so many people come in with their own agendas and so many people want to shine you know they use this profession advocacy activism to shine and get through their own individual traumas i'm not speaking on anybody uh, i'm not talking about anything i'm not i'm not calling out anybody's name i don't want no drama trauma but how do we how do we how do we come together where it's impactful and actually has influence on, on our policy. So, so th there's a number of things we're raised, but I'm going to first ask this question. Do doesn't it seem a little odd that our elected officials uh, will uh, fund a program here and there, they'll fund a project here and there, in order to be able to say that they're doing something but they never really solve the problem. They always fund the program, but they never really seem to solve the problem. So let me just say this, um, because, because you know I got some ideas, because I shared some with you. First, and, and, and I dealt with this at the beginning in my opening, is that all of the things that we've talked about are driven by poverty. Poverty is driven by racism. So let's deal with the issue of poverty. And what are the, there are several layers in that, because it's an onion, you gotta know that. We have to first create what's called universal basic income. We have got to provide, it's, it's also a reparations piece too. It is to provide every 
man and woman who, and, and young person with a thousand dollars a month if you are making if you are unemployed if you are a senior on fixed income if you are making less than forty thousand dollars a year and that's just phase one that's just phase one that has to be coupled with what dr king instructed us to do which was to fight for guaranteed jobs guarantee why is the uh, the Marion Barry Summer Youth Pro Summer um, Employment Program a summer employment program. Why isn't it a year-round program for our young people? For them to be employed, for them to have a you can't take care of yourself if you can't you, you don't have a job. No family can take care of themselves if they don't have a job or if they are not getting public assistance. And public assistance, as we know, is not enough. Public assistance doesn't meet the bar. Public assistance is actually a trap to keep you from thriving. So we need to be able to take the resources that DC has, and we have them. DC has the money. I'm telling you, DC has the money to make sure that every man, woman, and young person has a job, that the ones that do not, until that time happens, we give them the money, $1,000 a month. They're not going to go spend it on alcohol and drugs. That's not what happens. That's, that's not what has happened in the past when other uh, uh, locations have, em have employed universal basic income. That's not what we do. We invest in our children. We invest in ourselves. That's what we take the money and do. It, it ain't, you know, we're not going to spend it on a bunch of, bunch of Jordans. It's not going to work like that. And so we have to be able to allow that to happen the second thing is about housing okay and housing stability now you're listening to we act radio broadcasting from historic anacostia washington dc this is dc 101 on health broadcasting on community through covid we could talk about affordable housing and right now dc's definition of affordable housing is anything that is under 80 percent ami we know that half the communities in Washington, D.C. Washington, can't afford the housing that they talk about. So we need to be, be, be more serious about defining what affordable housing is. When you've got a, a family income of less than $30,000 a year, the 80% AMI ain't going to work. 70% AMI ain't going to work. 50% AMI ain't going to work. And I know you know these issues, and I know there are people on this call that know these issues. It's not going to work. So you have to be able to, number one, take the profit out of the developer that is doing the developing and saying we need to develop these at this rate, at this cost. First of all, as someone who went to school for architecture, I can tell you that they're using antiquated materials that cost sky high when there are new methods that are of housing that are being built in Europe right now, in Africa right now, in South Africa right now, that are pennies on the dollar. And you can create true affordable housing that is stable housing and that lasts forever. We're not talking about cheap material. We're just talking about material that costs less. So th that's one thing. Another thing we have to do is deal with our judicial and our, and, and, and our, um, um, a criminal justice system. If, if we don't deal with the criminal justice system and how it uh, is designed to be able to corral our young brothers and now our young sisters and put them in jail or put them in a situation where they're caught up in the system, it, 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 it doesn't allow them to get a leg up. I know personally a number of people that have recovered from opioid addiction that can't get a leg up because of a past criminal record from five years ago, even though they are now um, uh, uh, sober, even though they are no longer on opioids, but they can't get a leg up because of the criminal justice system and the criminal past. So we have to we have to really focus ourselves on dealing with these things, and then we have to do more of what Dr. Bruce just said, which is love ourselves. We've got to develop a language in our communities of loving ourselves, of of, of sharing love and sharing resources and being able to pick someone up when they're down. We've got to be able to develop that language again because it wasn't like we didn't have it before. It's just that we lost it and we've got to regain it. And we've got to talk about those things, especially when we talk to our young people. Adults participate in too much adultism. Right. What I'm going to say to the council 
is that they need to provide a thousand dollars to every man, woman, and child who's unemployed. Um, and we go, they need to provide, and I'm saying a thousand dollars a month. I'm not saying a thousand dollars every six months, thousand dollars a month, universal basic income, and to get the money to do it. And this is how they could get the money. Number one, they can tax those that have incomes of a million dollars or more. They can tax the wealthy. They, if you're making a million dollars a year, you're doing pretty damn good. You can pay a little bit more in taxes and then tax properties that are worth two and a half million dollars or more. They could do that. You know, a, a house costs a whole lot of money, even in Ward 8. So why would you tax a house that's 400000 in Ward 8 when you can tax houses that, hey, are worth $2.5 million because that's where wealth is. The second thing we can do, every developer develops property in the District of Columbia. But no one knows how much profit they make. Nobody, because they don't reveal it. It's a secret. They don't reveal it to the council. So why not say, okay, one and a half percent of every development you develop is going to go back into a community fund. And that community fund is going to fund jobs. That community fund is going to fund universal basic income. That community fund is going to fix up the poor housing that we have. The community fund is going to do that. And it's going to come from all of the new development that happens in the District of Columbia. This is what we need. We need to change the language of the game, not just within our own communities, but but for those that want to do us harm, we have to change the language of the game to get them to say, you know what? If we we gonna you're gonna have to consider this. Even if you don't agree with it, it's gonna be on the table because we're gonna put it on the table. It's on the table. There's nothing you can do about it, and we're gonna speak with one voice because we are tired of this. As my daughter would say, bull, bullshit. That sounds good. And I think that is a good launch for a collective voice. And I think we need more collectivism and, and more opportunities for, um, you know, our collective voice. And, and you know, I'm, I'm glad we have this platform uh, to get this out here because we need to come together. You know, our organizations need to come together. Um, the people within our organizations need to come together um, because it is a liberatory fight and we all we all have to be free for any of us individuals to experience that blessing of what freedom feels like, right? And in that vein, Brother Dr. Bruce, talk, talk to us about what we don't need the Wilson Building to, you know what you know why we can be autonomous from the wilson building why we can be independent from the wilson building talk talk to us about what it could be of us doing it together yeah. you know wow i just uh when you when you think about the potential of us and uh we have says is this not people like uh baba Yahanse, um, um we believe the whole Gregory Frem family because Ayan is on with the healing and Yahan says bring us to an economic piece. But just what you're talking about, it's like how do we frame how do we frame a piece where we are thriving, right? You know how do you how do you how do you how do you cycle our our resources within group so we 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 benefit. We're not we're we're in you know in perception we we don't give everything we have up because we're we're we believe that our salvation comes through commercialism you know what i mean so the healing piece is how we do it first like the first thing we have to do is heal and i i have to stress that we have to heal before we build we, we can't move forward another step until we step back and we heal from this past trauma piece and we can release it right once we understand that we can release it then we can figure out how we move forward. Like, you know, we have enough resources to, to be a nation. You know, right now we have enough resources to be a nation. We have enough talent to build everything we need. Like, you know, not, not about fighting anybody about anything. Like, you know, we don't, have, we don't have to put so much energy into what we don't want, right? You know, we don't have to put so much energy into asking somebody to stop whipping us. We can demand that we're not gonna be whipped no more. Like, that's not gonna be a part of this ideology where you can actually exploit us. But you know, as they said, the only way you can you can do it if the exploited don't know that that they're exploited, right? So this uh, now this piece, like what we have, and, and we have some we have some brilliant minds that really aren't being act, 
access because some people are being uh, stroked to maintain the status quo. And if, and we have to really understand what we're doing here. Like, you know, are we, are we uh, accepting a compromised freedom piece? in that like you know so uh in it so we say that okay we'll 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 accept this right now but it's not freedom and the masses aren't making this so our masses you know they they don't get anything like at, at the end of the day so that that's not working so when we have our council of elders like we talked about that we come through and we're transparent about the resources that we have and we fund what's working like, you know, there's a lot of brothers and sisters that are doing great work, but don't get a dime, man. Like, you know, other people get millions of dollars don't do, and, and don't even know the people. We got to, we got to, we have to correct that, man. I mean, for, you know, really. And, and, you know, it's not really, my fight's not indirectly against anybody, but we have to correct that. Like, the resources have to go to the building, the building of what, of what we want next. And, and, and that's going to do it, man. We don't have to be extras in our own movie. You know what I mean? Because we're stars, right? We're stars. Why? Because we have 72 trillion cells inside of our body that makes us a constellation. Can you imagine 72 trillion cells, man? Individual cells that make up each person? That's a miracle, man. 250 million cells fertilize one egg makes every birth a miracle. We're miracles, man. Every child, every child is a miracle, man. We're, you know, so we have to really look at us that way, man. So once we can actually frame it in, in, in the excitement of who we are and what we build in next and bring the right people to the table because we got some brilliant intelligent people man that are being suppressed right now because like like ambrose said like he's not gonna kiss the ring you know what i mean it's just like some people just like they're there because they're getting a hookup period like you know what i mean and so we gotta we gotta we gotta do something about that man and and we can you know what i mean we can we can heal together we can move together and we can create something uh great for all of us well, we all thrive and like, you know, no, we don't got to throw nobody under the bus. Everybody gets to thrive here. You know what I mean? We don't have to, we don't have to, we don't have to throw nobody under the bus. So everybody gets to thrive, but let's, you know, let's actually uh, decide to do that intentionally and, and start it right now. Like, you know, let's come out of the pandemic with a plan. You know, the, the black agenda, right? You know, for real, like, you know, coming out of the pandemic, this is how we're going to do it. Resources are going this way and, and, and let's build it, man. Let's do it for our children. Well, you know, we're going to be talking, Dr. Bruce. So, you know, I, I fully believe in that. I, I don't like us, even though it, you know, I don't like our own money being utilized for, for our own suffering. Mm. And that's the challenge when dealing with that mainstream system, because they're actually using the, the resources that we generate um, to build the systems that continuously hurt us and harm us. Um, but at the same time, we we have to we have to create options and create an alternative uh, for our own well-being. We can't depend upon the systems that benefit from our from our destruction to ever you know create the the things we need to heal. Um, and I want to invite someone, all of you, to to an opportunity tomorrow night, and just so. We will um, pause there. This has been the DC 101 program on health. Uh, you're listening to Community Through COVID on We Act Radio. DC 101 is a monthly political education program of Serve Your City DC and Ward 6 Mutual Aid. Previous months have covered housing, public safety, budget, um, I'm I'm forgetting what uh, what some of the them were. You can find all that information at communitythroughcovid.com, and um, I did have to cut off the uh, the presentation a tiny bit. And what you just heard was a very slightly edited version of the DC 101 health program broadcast um, toward toward the end of May. And uh, you can find all the links for every organization that was represented and more information about the speakers at communitythroughcovid.com. And we'll be back next week with uh, new live programming. And I hope to continue sharing DC 101 
um, as it is uh, pr presented each month in, in a way that We Act Radio can do that. So with that, I will say have a great week and peace. <laughs>